Amen. All right. Hello, everyone. Church of Imperial Beach. If you'll open up to 208 in your red hymnals. 208 in your red hymnals. Sing a song to the Lord. Are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion bright? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father God, Lord, thank you so much for this chance to come and have service in your name. Lord, we are so grateful that even when we have a small congregation, that we know you're down here with us in the Spirit, Lord. And we want to pray that this singing can be sweet to your ears. And Lord, that you can bless everyone that was able to attend and anyone that's watching online. That they can receive a blessing from the singing and from the preaching. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. 70. 70 in your red hymnal. 70. We're going to do the first three verses. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power and love and purity. Last verse, we'll do it. We'll do the fourth one. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all 
thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. All right. Announcements. Now, uh, actually, I will do a praise report first. So we had a successful time soul winning on uh, yesterday, Saturday. Uh, this was Sister Thalia's first chance to come down and, and just to see how things are supposed to be running and, 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 and get a real feel for what the devil likes to do when, when we're preaching out here in Imperial Beach. And I told her and I warned her that the second we cross the, that IB San Diego line, uh, the devil always lets us, lets us know. Like clockwork, it happens every time. Um, and we don't get this when we go to Chula Vista. We don't get this when we go to the Walmart off uh, Palm and Nest, uh, Saturn. Saturn, Saturn. We don't get that. The second we cross that borderline, we always get the people that, that, that all, we always get the devil's messengers. So mm -hmm. I told her to stay around, stay close to me. And uh, I, I, t I teach her it's like this bubble that you want to be around. You don't, when someone gets in that bubble, that's when you should hand them a track. Uh, and, and you want to keep your wits about you. And remember, the, uh, God sent the apostles in groups of two. You don't want to go out there alone because you, you'd be surprised what could happen when it's just you. So we had a lot of stuff happen within the first 30 minutes of us going out there. Um, Brother Lewis was tracking cars, as he does faithfully. And uh, Sister Thalia, uh, she, had, she was holding up the sign. And I used that as an opportunity to go out and street preach. And I was street preaching on the corner. And... Uh, a lot of people were waving, giving thumbs up. They like to see that. You don't see that often in Pearl Beach or at all. You know, you'll see people walking up and down the street. You know, you, you, they, you can tell they're Christian, but they're not really doing much for the Lord. They're just, you know, making themselves known, I guess. But uh, we actually went out there to street preach, and, and, and the Lord blessed it. But before we even got to that, we had two messengers from Satan uh, let us know that they don't appreciate what we're doing down here. First, I was telling Thalia about a Je about Jehovah's Witness doctrine, and then she whenever you mention Jehovah's Witness doctrine, all of a sudden it's like Jehovah's Witnesses come out of the woodworks from out of nowhere, just to tell you what they think, and that's exactly what happened. This Jehovah's Witness just literally, I don't know where he came from. He just he was walking outside of Goodwill or something, and he he overheard us say something about Jehovah's Witness, and he says, "What'd you say? Oh, we're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Are you one? What'd you say about them?" Oh, they don't believe Jesus is God, which they don't. And we actually did a lesson on that a couple weeks back, a couple months back. And uh, they don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe that hell is eternal or that it's a burning lake of fire. Uh, they have a lot of strange doctrine, and they're a cult. But that guy didn't think so. He thought we were a cult, and he he started bad mouthing us, our doctrine. He started, what kind of, what are, what are you? What Baptist? What kind are you? Southern Baptist? He's black, by the way. That's why I'm talking like that. Uh, no, we're Bible believing Baptists. We believe the Bible. And what do you say to that? <laughs> so I, I learned from last week when we were in soul winning, don't waste time with the, the nut jobs. Just, you know, if, once you realize they're not going to budge, just say, hey, I don't want to waste time. I got to go out and street. I got to go out and preach the gospel. And the guy was chasing us. He was chasing after us, trying to, like, I don't know, argue. And after five minutes, we were just like, you know, I'm, we're wasting time with you. We don't want to argue. Uh, and we just went onto the street corner. And he, he actually, he pulled out of his car, he moved onto the street, and he was still yelling at us from his car. So uh, I can tell that we struck a chord with that guy. And the next guy we talked to was a demon-possessed man. He was jogging, and he was crossing the street, and we just happened to be on the street corner, and he was waiting for the light to turn. So, you know, we got to talk to him for about three minutes while, while he was waiting for that light. And boy, did he let us know he didn't, uh, he didn't appreciate Christians. So he, he would badmouth us, he'd badmouth the Bible, and he got right in my face, you know, about as close as, closer to you are to me from that camera. He got about three inches from my face. And I just told Dahlia, sit, sit right there, just let me handle this. And she got to see that whole altercation go down and nothing happened from it. But uh, he said, two things I don't talk about, it's religion and politics. And I go, why are you talking about it then? And uh, the guy just wanted to talk. The guy wanted to uh, he didn't want anything to do with doctrine. He said, uh, you know, you should probably go. I told him, listen, we're, we're out here fighting, uh, preaching against the devil. You know, they just opened up a pot shop down the, pot shop down the street. And uh, they did, by the way. And we're going to be preaching hard against that soon, believe you me. And the guy, you know, he said, maybe you should smoke some pot. Oh, what? oh do you smoke? Oh, no, I don't. Well, why are you telling me to smoke if you don't? And the guy just couldn't. He, he, he was demon possessed. I really believe that. Um, but after that. After those two uh, uh, 
altercations, it really got it, it got really sweet. We had a woman that was crossing the street from us and or towards us, and I could tell she was crying. We asked her what's wrong, and she told us all this stuff happening with her family. She's about to be homeless, and uh, her name's Tanya. We asked her if she's saved. She is saved, uh, and we want to want you guys to pray for Sister Tanya um, that she can find a place to stay, that her that she can uh, hold on to custody of her child. And just pray for her, and hopefully she can come to service soon. Uh, I asked Sister Thalia to get her number. That's convenient having a woman. You know, I don't have to be asking for women's numbers and all that stuff. Uh, and she got her number, and she's keeping in correspondence with her. So please pray that Thalia have grace uh, and, and, and wisdom in dealing with that situation. And hopefully she can get her to come to church. Who knows? Um, after that, Sister Thalia, she was holding up the sign, and then someone rolled down their window and waved at her. Uh, it, she knew her. It was someone from Thalia's old church. And she texted her and said, Yeah, that's just encouraging to see you out there. I was not expecting that. And you know what? All this happened in 30 minutes, by the way. By the way, we saw Sister Amy crossing the street within those 30 minutes, and we got to talk to her for a moment. Um, yeah, so I got about uh, this much tracks passed out. So. Yeah, she got Brother Lewis got about a bear claw's worth of tracks out. Um, yeah. We got That's how much we have left? No, 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 no. We, we have this much left. Okay, good. Do you still have the Spanish ones, or do you have to order those? I still have about that many Spanish ones. I get caught up all on Monday. Yeah, okay. Um, so it was a great blessing, and like I said, it, this all happened within 30 minutes, and I told you guys that as the Holy Spirit is working in you, you're going to start to notice things happen around you. Oh, there's Sister Amy. There she is. Like I said, as the Holy Spirit's working through you, the whole things are going to start to happen around you. As I say that, Sister Amy comes walking to the church. Um, amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, we were just talking about you. We saw you yesterday, and we were talking about how things start to happen around us, and here you come. Uh, hi, Ella. We just got done singing, but we can sing a song once we're done for you. I know you wanted to sing last week. Nice to see you both. Are you shy? She's a little girl. Don't be shy. shy. Don't be shy. Uh, I don't bite. Just Brother Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> I only bite a little bit. Yeah. Nibble. Um, it's a good thing you got here because now we can do the offering. <laughs> Let me get my wallet. Well, we're praying for more people to come. So. There's a butterfly. It's a butterfly. Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Sister Amy, can you give us the um, basket, please? Oh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, let's pray for the offering real quick. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for Sister Amy being here. and uh, Lord, I just pray that you can bless her wallet right now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I pray that you can bless this offering. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. And, and the least we can do is just give what we can. And, Lord, I pray that you can continue to bless us, Lord, so we can give more. That we can have a spirit of charity in this church, Lord. A spirit of charity that wants to give freely of the heart, Lord, with no expectation of, a, of, a, of, of anything worldly, Lord. We just want to do it because we love you, God. And just pray, uh, please bless, bless this offering in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Now, actually, we may, you made it just in time. We're going to do one more hymn, um, and then we're going to go to the sermon. Let me give you the book and I'll show you where it is. Okay. 363 363 and can you read? You can't read? Well, you just look at it. Maybe it'll, it'll come to you. So we're going to be going... Yeah, put this down. We're going to be going right here. So. Standing by a perfect truth Eating God's command Honor them the faithful To all tales to Daniel's band there to be a Daniel, there to stand alone, there to have a purpose firm, there to make it known. And then you go to number two. Many mighty men. And you go all the way down until you hit number four. You don't have to, you can just hold that, and if you want to, you can try and sing. If not, don't worry. 363, 363, look at the book. <laughs> there to be a Daniel. 363 in your hymnals. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, 
Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Go back up and then go to number two. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Are you following me guys? Mm -hmm. Amen. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land. Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Last one. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Amen. Amen. Good job, Ella. Wow. Do you want to go do another song before I start preaching? One more? Yeah? yeah. That's a yes, right? Mm -hmm. Come on, one more. One more. Please? <laughs> Please? Yeah? Okay, one more. Ella said yes. <laughs> um, we're going to do Victory in Jesus. That's 496. Can you turn there, Ella? That's even one I can remember. 496. You're going to like this one, Ella. This is my favorite one. Or one of them, at least. It's okay, I'll give you time. Go back to uh, 496. You're good. You're getting there. You, you need help? Let me show you. Okay, so see the numbers right here? Look. Um, see right there? So 506, you go back. 504, 502, 500. Oh, look, there's 496 right there. And it goes, I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And then you keep going down. You get it. You find it? You were, you were showing mom. Okay, and we're going to have Ella come up and sing. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just Pretty kidding. Pretty soon, huh? No. <laughs> you would like it. You'll like it. Trust me, you're going to like this song. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Next page. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God. He, I'm sorry, I missed my place. I was looking at you, Ella. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Now you go back to the first page, and number two. And when I do that, when I do the, uh, he sought me and bought me, you say this, so, can you do that, Ella? Try it, come on. <laughs> Next verse. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. 
Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me, sold with his redeeming blood. Praise God, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. All right, last time. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me, so with his redeeming blood. Praise God, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Good job, Bella. Amen. Good job. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, I want everyone to get their Bibles, if you can. Get your Bibles, if you can. We're going to be talking about something that is politically incorrect. Amen. You can put that down, Ella. You don't worry about it. Now, I'm going to be getting politically incorrect, so if you get triggered or offended well you know what the bible says jesus says that blessed is he who's not offended in me and uh you, if you don't if you choose not to be offended about this message then you're gonna get a blessing i guarantee it and little boys and girls right now they're getting indoctrinated to believe certain things that is not biblical so you have to be guarding your children from these ideas that the devil and the world are propagating in your children's schools in the media in television you see it all around you we see a gay pride flag across the street waving at city hall and you know what to the world that's normal but to us that's sin now i want to go ahead and pray a sin we're going to open up to genesis 19 verse 1 actually go to genesis 13 verse 13 and then we'll go pray genesis 13 the topic of my sermon is on sodom sodom and you go to genesis 13 13 the bible says but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you so much for the church, and we pray that you can bless this message, Lord, that you can guide my tongue and keep me away from the flesh, keep me out of it, Lord. Just have your way with this message. Touch the hearts and ears of the listeners, both here and online, and I pray that the world that is listening out there, that they can be smitten in their hearts, and Lord, that they can come to repentance. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So, as I said, we're going to be teaching on preaching on Sodom. Sodom. Now, we go to Genesis 19, verse, 9, uh, verse 1, and we're going to be introducing some characters and uh, the setting, and we're going to be talking about what Sodom's sin is, the sins of Sodom. That's the, top, that's the title <laughs> of the sermon. Now, verse, Genesis 19, verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and, the, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now my, to my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now I want to introduce to you the character of Lot. The character of Lot. Now Lot, the nephew of Abraham, if you recall, the nephew of Abraham is the perfect picture of a backslidden Christian. He's the perfect picture of a backslid Christian, a Christian that has started to backslide, a Christian that has started to forsake God, a Christian that has gone into the world and away from the Spirit. And he is the picture of that. Now, notice that, that so, uh, Lot, he is noted as being in the gate. Now, in the gate, that is a place in the, in the city where judgment is taking place. And, so, and Lot is a judge, and he judges, uh, he judges people. He has a position of power and authority in Sodom. He is a great man in Sodom. But notice this, in verse 2, he's not only a great man in Sodom, he's a servant. He calls, them, he calls himself their servant. 
he realizes that he's a servant. And you, as a backslid Christian, should realize that you are indeed a servant as well. Now, how do you reconcile this? This Lot, he's in the world. He is someone that is that is a servant of God, but he's still in the world. He's still in Sodom. Now, we all know that Sodom is, is a wicked place, as I told you in, 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 in Genesis 13, 13. But let's go back there. Let's go back there to Genesis 13. We'll go back to uh, 19, but I want to go back to Genesis 13. I want to see how he came to Sodom. I want to look at how he came to Sodom. Now, if you recall, I'll go to Genesis 13. And I'm going to start from verse 1. And Abram went out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and a lot with them, into the south. Now, if you, if you remember, Egypt, as I taught you, and, and the Bible teaches, is a type of the world. Does God want you in the world? Does God want you to be worldly? No. So they're coming straight out of Egypt, and good, they should be. And they went with them into the south. And Abram was very rich in, in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. So that finally, Abraham's going back where he should have been, and he, he came full circle, and he's back at Bethel where he should have started, where he should have been in the first place. Now, but he's very, he, are you, he's rich and he has a lot of gold. He came out of Egypt. Is that a good thing, though? Is it a good thing that he got rich? You ever hear the phrase, mo money, mo problems? Well, that's what happened. He was so rich. You're going to see what, what, that, what situation that put him and Abram. Uh, him and Lot in, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram's calling upon God, and verse 5, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, and they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So they're, Abram and Lot, they got so rich that now they got too much. They have so much stuff that they're butting heads. There's not enough land. There's not enough space for the two of them. So that, uh, Abram's telling them, Hey, listen, I don't want to fight. We're gonna Let's just split up. And, and he's saying in verse 9, Is not the whole land before the separate thyself I pray thee separate thyself I pray thee from me if thou wilt take the gift the left hand then I will go to the right or if thou depart to the right hand uh, then I will go to the left and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden as thou comest unto Zar so right now uh, jo uh, Lot he's looking at, at all the plains and he's looking at Sodom and he played he, the Lord pays special note that Sodom is very well off. It's, it's well watered. There's a lot of lush vegetation. It's got, it's got farmland. It's perfect for him. And and Abram told him, hey, you go wherever you want to go, and I'm going to go the opposite direction so we don't fight. Now, that's a perfect picture of a, of a Christian that's willing to show a charity, that's willing to just, you know what, you do, uh, you go which, whatever whatever you way think is best, and I'm going to take the hit. That was how That was Abram's heart right there. And this was before he became Abraham, by the way. Uh, and 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 Lot's looking at Sodom, and he's going, man, that place looks good. You know, you think of right now, people are in, in in California. They've been voting themselves into a hole, and now they're looking at Texas or places that are that have typically voted red, that have been well off, that have been wise in how they deal with uh, the economy, and they're looking at that place and, man, I want to go there. Yeah, what? So you can ruin it too? <laughs> See? There's nothing new under the sun. The Bible te teaches all you that teaches this all to you. Now then, Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. He wasn't in Sodom yet, but man, was he looking at it. You ever have longing for the world and just go, man, I wish I could go to the bar right now or I wish I could just go and, you know, to the game or party or do anything that's just worldly. And you're a saved Christian thinking that. And you have your pit, your, your tent pitched somewhere it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be pitched toward. Where are, you, where are your eyes looking? What are you looking toward? Because whatever you're, wherever you're facing, that's probably the direction you're going, amen? That's what happened a lot. Before he became, before he went to Sodom, he was in Jordan looking at Sodom. Verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Notice that. 
Verse 13. You ever hear the phrase, uh, uh, 13 is an unlucky number? You ever hear that? Oh, I, 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 you know, there's buildings that don't have a 13th floor because of that. Where's that come from? That's Bible. God, he, he assigns meaning to numbers, if you didn't know. Why does God always do stuff in sevens? You know, we have seven days in the week. We have seven colors in the rainbow. We have seven notes in music. People have seven appendages on their body. Uh, why does God do things in seven? Is there a meaning behind it? Yes, there is. What about 13? Is it, why is it always a negative number? Here's 13, the 13th verse. And then count the, count the words. There's 13 words in that verse. And, 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 and count Sodom and Gomorrah. So, there's five letters in Sodom and eight in Gomorrah. That's 13 letters. Huh. There's something to it. And if you, if you trust in God and you want to have an authenticator of his book, you can go to the numbers. The numbers prove it. You can't do this in any other book. You can't, you can't look through the numbers and see God's hand at work. Go to the first verse and last verse of the Bible. Count the letters, count the vowels, count the consonants. It's the same. There's no way that that's not God's word. But atheist scholars and people that want to just deny God's word, they're not going to look at that. But if you're the believer and you want to look at it, you'll have even greater faith in the book. Amen? Now let's get back to Sodom. I don't want to be there for too long, but let's get back so you can take a, a spiritual lesson. Now Lot, he, he had his tent pitched towards Sodom. That's how he got there. Uh, and he was a great and powerful man in that city. And he was somebody important. He was a somebody. And here's the thing, though, is that if you recall, uh, God was going to judge Sodom. God wanted to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. He was going to send fire and brimstone. He said, if there's, if there's, you know, if there's t even ten righteous men in that city, I will not destroy Sodom. Um, but was was Lot altogether righteous? Well, he was a backslid. He was a picture of a backslid Christian, and his and he wasn't looking at his righteousness, at Lot's righteousness. He was looking. He was imputing righteousness to to Lot. Okay, he had righteousness imputed to him, just like we have the righteousness of Christ imputed onto us. Listen, I'm not righteous, you're not righteous, you're not righteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, okay? But the righteousness of God is what's imputed to us. Impute means to be put onto you. That's imputation. Remember that. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't living a righteous Christian life. No, but he, still, he was still a servant, though. Now, I want, to, I want you to pay attention to what happens to Lot. You know, he pitches his tent towards Sodom. He moves to Sodom. He starts a fam He has a family there. He has, he's a, he has a lot of things there. He has all his wealth and his material. And what's going to happen is he's going to suffer loss, but he's also going to be saved from that loss. Now, let's look at Sodom. Sodom, as I said, was, a rich, and, was, a, it was rich in vegetation. It was in the plains of Jordan. And he, it had rich vegetation, and it was, a, it was you know... It's like San Diego. You know, we have the best climate in the world. The best climate in the world. People pay hundreds of thousands of dollars just to move here. And we have rich vegetation, even though it's all artificial. You know, technically we're a desert. But we have all the, we have the beach. We have a beachfront property that's hundreds of thousands, million dollars just to move there for a small two-bedroom, you know, condo. And, but we're the envy of the world in terms of climate. Well, Sodom was a lot like that. It had all these things going for it. It was so nice. But have you noticed that the places that are so nice and have so much money and so much wealth and power, that they're always the ones, the places that are the most wicked. They're always the places that, that, that uh, exalt the devil. That, you know, we just, I was talking about the, the pot shop that just opened up. You know, we have, how many bars does Imperial Beach have? How many pot shops are we going to open up? How many uh, people want to live in lust and sin? And why? Because the devil is, raw, is strong here. I was telling you how we go street preaching. The devil always lets us know he doesn't appreciate us preaching here in, in Imperial Beach. Right. Uh, he, does, he has something to do with coastal cities. And I don't know exactly what that is, but it's always whenever people see the wealth, they want to go, they gravitate towards it. And with that, that's like a honeypot. The devil lures you in with that. And that's, and, what he, that's what he did with the devil. And in this park. Amen. <laughs> You're right. Now, Sodom was like your typical Los Angeles area or your typical New York City or, or, or Hillcrest. You guys know Hillcrest? That was Sodom and Gomorrah, if, you, if, if you've ever seen it. And these guys were, uh, it, it, this city was guilty of so much wickedness. It had uh, uh, sexual perversion to the point of bestiality. Do you believe that? 
bestiality. You remember 20 years ago when they were doing that whole gay, uh, uh, gay marriage fight and, they, and people would, on the right would say, oh, no, they're gonna, if, they, if we give them that, then they're going to go straight on to bestiality. Where did they get that from? That's Bible. You know, um, it's a slippery slope. Sin is a slippery slope. And if you go to Jude, verse 6 to 7, we're gonna, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. Okay, you got to read between the lines when you're reading this book sometimes. Read between the lines of what God's showing you. Okay, now you don't have to, you can take it or leave it, but I personally, I believe they were getting straight into bestiality. And you go to Jude 6 to 7, um, Jude 6 to 7, that's the second to last book in your Bible. It's funny how this is the second, the second to last book. This is the, the one book he puts before Revelation. Uh, I wonder why God chose that. Verse 6, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved into everlasting chains under darkness uh, in everlasting under darkness under the judgment of the great day verse 7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example unto the uh, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire the strange flesh what does that mean you go to 1 Corinthians 4, 15 1 Corinthians 15 uh, going to get a little bit of a meat doctrine here but first corinthians 15 strange in the bible means foreign it means not of the same kind it means foreign like a like a strange woman is a woman from a different country a strange uh strange flesh would be foreign flesh now first corinthians 15 verse 39 the bible says uh, all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts another of fishes and another of birds so man, what is one kind of flesh? A flesh of men, that's one flesh. You have the flesh of men, I have the flesh of men. So a strange flesh would be the flesh of animals. you believe that? Sodom and Gomorrah, they got so wicked that they were starting to get into that kind of stuff. Oh, that's offensive, preacher. That's degrading. That's Bible. Sin is a slippery slope. In the last 60 years, we went from being not being able to show man and woman in the same bed together on TV to full-blown pornography channels, to same-sex couples on children's television shows, and now drag queens are teaching your children that it's okay what they're doing, that they should be doing the same thing as them. You want to tell me that's not wicked? Children's school teachers are teaching your kids how to pleasure themselves off your tax dollars. You believe that? You want to tell me that's not wicked? You have, this is documented, teachers and schools are taking your children without your custody to give them hormone blockers so that they don't grow up to be a man or they don't grow up to be a woman so that they can have that, that, that female body that they think they want to have. You have, any, you have any idea how wicked that is? They're confused. The clowns are, rucking, are, are running the circus here. You can't even let little boys be little boys and little girls be little girls. You know how crazy it is that we live in a country where the Supreme Court judge can't tell if a woman is a woman or a, a, a man is a man? And the reason they say is, I can't say that because I'm not a doctor? Have you ever gone to the bathroom? You want to know if you're a boy or girl? Go to the bathroom and tell me. I can't believe you need a, uh, an eight years of college to tell me if it's a boy or a girl. Now let's talk about the sodomites. The sodomites. These people were sexually perverse, wicked, with no conscience, and willing to defile the messengers of God. Okay, let's go to Genesis 19 again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go take you there. Genesis 19. We're gonna talk about them again. Um, so we were, we left off at verse two. In verse three, he's talking to the angels. Okay, Lot's talking to the angels, and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now remember, Lot's saying, hey, don't stay out in the street. I want you, just stay at my place, your servant. Stay, stay, stay with me. Uh, Lot knew something about this place. He knew something about the wickedness going on here, and he was still living there. And uh, verse 4, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed them, that means surrounded, the, the house round about both old and young, all the people from every quarter. It wasn't just the old men, it was the young men too. Do you have any idea what that, how wicked that is? That the young ones are even in this kind of sin. Okay? And they called on a lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Do you know what it means to know someone biblically? It means a, a husband knows his wife when they when they marry. 
That's what it means to know them. All right? It means to know them. That's biblical. Uh, uh, that's, that's to know them biblically. Now, verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. He's trying to appeal to them, saying, hey, don't do this. You don't have to do this. He's, he, because he knows who these beings are that are in front of him. These are angels. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn with me and will needs to be and needs be a judge. Now will we deal with worse with thee than with them. And they pressed store upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. They wouldn't listen to reason. They wouldn't listen to uh, rebuke. They wouldn't listen to, hey, that's don't do that. This is sinful. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't it sound like the world we're living in today, where people won't listen to the word of God, where people won't hearken to what God has to say, to what a, 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 a Christian has to say to them? Verse 10, But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were weary themselves to find the door. So they were smitten blind. Remember a couple week, uh, last week I preached on pride, how pride can blind you? Well, let's look at this. Uh, one of the sins of Sodom was their pride. Was their pride. Go to Ezekiel. Hold your hand on Genesis and go to Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 16.49. The Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughter. And in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Our country is exactly the same way. They were, they were prideful. What do you think they... they, they that was, that's how you get blind. See, they wouldn't have gotten blind if they weren't so prideful. And now, what happened? Their iniquity... Their iniquity was pride, fullness of bread. They had, they had all, everything they needed. Okay, they had lush vegetation, they had food, and they had, uh, they were idle. Remember that they were idle. What was David's sin when he, when he sinned before Bathsheba? He, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was idle. He wasn't supposed to be on that rooftop, but idleness got to him, and because of that, it led to sexual sin. Well, idleness got to Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, now. These sodomites were, were wicked, and they want to and they want to say that oh, oh I, I'm just doing what I was born to do. I was born this way. They want to say that God made me this way. God made you to be confused as a little child to think that you to think your lustful flesh is is right. Go to go to First Corinthians fourteen thirty three. Keep your hands on on Genesis, but go to First Corinthians. The whole argument that that God made me this way when I. The reason I have all this confusion is because God made me this way. They want to blame God for their problems. God did not confuse you. God did not confuse you. You go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. The Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God didn't cause you to be confused. The only person that would that would that would benefit from your confusion is the devil. It's the devil that caused you to be confused. Remember, it was Jesus that told the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. When you're born the first time, you have that sinful nature, and that sinful nature is natural to you, but it's not from God, it's from the, the devil. When you're born the first time, you're of the fa your father, the devil, and your, your lust, the natural lust of your flesh is what you want to do. Why did Jesus tell Nicodemus you must be born again? It's because the first one wasn't good. The second birth is what's good. Now, listen, the idea that that, uh, that uh, God made you this way, that doesn't hold up. That's not true. The problem is, that if you go to Romans chapter 14, verse 16, we have a conscience. And every one of us has this conscience that when we when we uh, uh, do something wrong, that our conscience will start to tell us, hey, that's wrong. But the longer, I'll, I'll take you first to Romans chapter 2, show you this. You have to realize that, listen, you don't have an excuse because you don't have the Bible. God gave you a conscience in your heart to know what's right and wrong. Romans chapter 2, verse uh, 14 to 16. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which shew the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts 
the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel so you have a conscience in your heart a conscience and you don't have the you don't have to have the law to have a law written in your heart now these people that want to say God made me this way uh, no he gave you a conscience he gave you a conscience and and there's a thing that happens with your conscience when you choose not to listen to it when you choose not to listen to your conscience uh, it'll grow numb to the point where you don't have it anymore go to second Timothy second or first Timothy chapter 4 first Timothy chapter 4 your conscience uh, there's things that we do as Christians that we don't have any qualms with because our conscience doesn't tell us that it's wrong anymore but it's still wrong listen there's some things that you might be doing in your life that I don't have a conviction over that uh, well listen whatever what happened there has to be a reason you don't have that conviction okay uh, there's people that, that they've, grown, they've lived in sin their whole lives. They don't have a problem with fornication anymore. They're still saved, but they're still living in sin. That doesn't justify or excuse their sins. It's, their, it's because their conscience has grown numb. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of devils, speaking <laughs> lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Their conscience can be burned and seared to the point where they no longer feel it. They no longer have a conscience. It's gone. It's, 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 it's worn away. And that's exactly what our what your what your what, what your standard lost sinner is like today. You know? They they've been so indoctrinated with the idea that, you know, uh, love is love. Have you heard that now? Love is love. You know what that means? That means uh, uh, you know I can do whatever I want as long as I do it in the name of love. Okay, they want to use love to justify sin, and their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. Listen, there is a point where you were, if you're listening to this message, if you were struggling with 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 the sin of, of homosexuality, of, of feeling like you're a, a a woman in a man's body, that's not natural. That's something from the flesh, and we all have that sin to contend with. Listen, you're not a, you're not special. Okay, we all have our own besetting sin. Okay, for some it's it, for some it's fornication, for some it's homosexuality, for some it's theft, some it's lying. But we all have our sin to contend with, a besetting sin that constantly is we're we're gonna have to battle with for the rest of our lives. Okay, your besetting sin doesn't it doesn't justify you or give you an excuse. Okay, I was born this way. No, you weren't. I I was just following my heart. You ever hear that? Just follow your heart. Your heart will lead you the right way. That's not right. What's the heart? What's the Bible say about your heart? Proverbs 38. Proverbs 38. I'll tell you what the Bible says about following your heart. The Bible warns you against following your heart. I'm going to take you two places. Proverbs 28, verse 26. The Bible says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your heart. Trust God's word. God's word won't lead you astray. Your heart will. You want proof? Go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, that's after Jer... Oh, no, not Ecclesiastes. Go to Jeremiah 27. Jeremiah 27, verse 19. I'm going to tell you why you're, you can't trust your heart. This is why you can't trust your heart. Uh, Jeremiah, verse, chapter 27, verse 9 to 10. Therefore, hearken not... Oh, I'm sorry. Where was that? Oh, wait, what? Is it 19? <laughs> I wrote down the wrong verse, you know. Maybe it's, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? I, I had to butcher that one a little bit, I think. But after that, it tells you that God tries the heart, and he tries the reins in your heart, and he tries to see where, where your heart's at. He wants to know what's guiding your heart. Listen, if, you're, if your heart's being guided by, guided by God, uh, that's the only way to get, get peace. But if you're being guided by the lust of your flesh, uh, that's only going to take you down the wrong road. You can't trust your heart. You have to trust God. Amen? You see, these guys don't change. They want the world to change around them. They want equal rights. They want, uh, they, I, I want our equal marriage. You know, marriage is between a man and a woman. It's not between a, a man and a man or a woman and a woman. That's a, it's an institution instituted by God. Okay? It, it, it's such a, it's such a, it's so uh, uh, cliche, but it's true. It's, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. See? I've heard so many people say that and you roll your eyes every time, but it's true. It's true. And your kids aren't going to hear this out there in the world. Why? 
because the human heart is 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 desperately wicked. Okay, they're being blasted on all sides by gay. We're doing this because of gay pride. It's Pride Month. Okay, Sodom was proud proud of their sin. Okay, and your kids aren't going to hear this anymore. That's why it's so important to take your kids to church, especially while they're young. Don't worry, Ella. We're almost done. Are you learning? Are you learning? <laughs> Remember, don't follow your heart, follow God, and he'll guide you. Amen? Now, our country is exactly the same way as Sodom. It's exactly, we are desperately wicked. We have all this, this uh, riches, and, and we have all these things. We have, you know, you can come home to a full fridge. You have uh, EBT. You have free food anytime you want. You have uh, free internet anywhere you want to go. You have, you have, you're well connected. You have a place to stay. Most people do. Uh, you have programs, and you have all these things, and and I'll take you to what the Bible says about people like that. What what you have is a uh, is an issue with uh, pride, and you know what the Bible tells you that you're a certain kind of church age. You're in the church age of Laodicea, because they have the same issue we have today. Laodicea is the same kind of church uh, age is the same kind of church that we are in this day and age. All right. The Laodiceans, go to verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, will say that the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. We're lukewarm. See, so then, uh, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of, our, out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Doesn't that sound like us today? We're rich. We have... Increase with goods and we don't need anything. Why do we need God when we have a place to stay? Why do we need God when we have food in the fridge? Why do we need God when we don't have any uh, uh, medical issues that are pressing right now? Listen, you couldn't go to the hospital 2,000 years ago. You had a broken leg? All right, well, start writing your will, brother. You better hope you have some family to take care of you. All right? You want to be a woman then have a job? All right. Well, good luck with that. You're probably going to get uh, pillaged pretty soon. You know, you're probably going to get... It wasn't a friendly time to be a woman. You know, the Bible wants to, people want to attack the Bible, say, oh, well, your Bible teaches polygamy. Uh, if you lived 2,000 years ago, you would understand why God allowed it. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't for it, but he, he allowed it. God allows certain things in our lives because he understands the consequence of, uh, of a woman living in that kind of time period with no protection. You know, you didn't have the police like you do now. Okay? Imagine being a woman in that time period where any man can just take you and do what he wants with you and what, what are you going to be able to do? See? We have police today. It's funny how the left wants to attack police too. They want to attack all the things that have to do with authority. Remember I told you something? I told you that uh, the, the, the modern age, they want to attack authority. They want to be the authority. Not you, not police, not uh, government. They want to be the authority. Well, this is all going back to back then. Now, right, let me finish the verse. Uh, they have needed nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Huh. There go, we go back to Sodom. We're going back to Sodom. They were blind. They were blind. Go back to uh, Genesis 19. Don't worry, Ella. I'm almost done. <laughs> Just can you pay attention for me a little while longer, please? Okay, we're going to be teaching about, go back to verse 11, verse 12. And the, Lot, and the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides uh, son-in-laws and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy the place because the city of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked on his sons. There's the unbelieving spirit again. It happened in the uh, days of Noah. It happened with Lot, and it's going to happen with us. Your family members, they're going to see that God is working in your life, and they're not going to see that the pow that, that, that they got to get right too. They're going to think, Ah, oh, that crazy old Lewis, he just wants to you know, push religion on me. Oh, Amy, she wants me to get right with Jesus. Why don't she get her own problems straight first before she comes talking to me? They have a spirit of unbelief. They have a spirit of pride. Verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And they're telling Lot, just get, a, get everything you can and go. 
drop everything. Your your cattle, your house, everything. Just get your wife, your your daughters, and go. We're, this place is gonna burn. And while he lingered, the man laid a put up hold open upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters the Lord being merciful unto unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city you know God's mercy endureth forever you know God's been so merciful to us a lot of people don't know what the difference between grace and mercy is grace is when God gives you something you don't deserve salvation mercy is when he doesn't give you something you do deserve eternal hellfire well God showed a lot in his family mercy mercy Lot deserved this punishment that was coming his way, but you know what? He's a picture of the uh, of the saved Christian that's backslid. He's a picture of what we are. How many times have you backslid this year? How many times have you done something you weren't supposed to? How many times have you not honored God uh, who saved you, who shed his blood for you, who lived a sinless, perfect life for you? More than I bet you want to admit. And I'm not... I, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, man. I, I'm the same as you guys. Listen, if you guys knew the kind of sin your pastor deals with, you wouldn't want me here in the pulpit. You'd probably vomit. And you know what? If I knew the same things I know about me that you know about yourself, I I'd vomit about your sins too. Okay? Listen, we're all sinners saved by grace. Okay? Just because just just there's a preacher up here doesn't mean he doesn't battle with sin. And don't ever, put, don't ever put me on a pedestal. And don't ever put your sins on a pedestal either. All right, we're all sinners. Now, verse 18, or verse 17, And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. That's always a bad thing to tell God. Oh, not so, my Lord. Don't speak too soon. Um, that's what Peter said. I'm not going <laughs> to. We'll talk about that later. Not the peanut, the bunny rabbit. Okay. Um, verse 19. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. There's that grace. Okay. And thou hast magnified thy mercy, which uh, which my, which thou hast shewed unto, unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. So he's, he, notice here. Lot is, is telling God, listen, you, you've been so graceful to me. I don't, I don't deserve this, and you've been merciful to me. You saved my life. And then he, wisely, he makes a request of God. You, you have to understand that God is not some domineering uh, tyrant over your life. He is graceful, he is merciful, and he is reasonable. God is reasonable. You can reason with him. He's not going to tell you something to, to do something that he knows you can't do. And... Lot appeals to God's sense of grace and mercy here. Um, Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? He's saying, God, that city's so far. Can I just go to this tiny one? It's just a little one. Can I, can I go here? And look what happens. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. God spared that little city for Lot. Well, isn't that something? People want to blame God for everything, but I've seen in the Bible that God is more merciful and more graceful than anyone wants to give him credit for. Okay? His mercy endures forever. Go to Psalm, uh, go to Psalm 136 sometime and you read that. Verse 22, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become hither, thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Oh, God's saying, I can't do anything until they come eat hither. Now, uh, I'm the angels saying that. Anyway, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. See how he waited for Lot to leave too? And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, that which grew, grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Didn't God tell, didn't she, they tell him not to turn their head, not to look back? But what happened? Well, his wife, she looked back at all the stuff that she had. She looked back at the car, at the garage, the two-car garage. She looked back at the country club that she, they would go to on the weekend. She looked back at the, uh, at the private school she would take the two daughters to. She looked back at all the things that she had that she didn't have anymore, that she lost. And what happened? She was lost too. 
You don't want to look back at the world. You don't want to look back. You don't want to have your tent pitched towards Sodom. Don't look at the world. Look at Christ. When you have your eyes set upon the world, the only thing you should be expecting is loss. Is loss. Verse 27, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Now I'm going to close things with a couple, close this with a couple more verses. Luke 17, 28. Luke 17, 28. You have to realize that Sodom will be judged, and you know what? Our world will be judged. Our world will be judged, and it'll be far better for Sodom than it was for the world, because Jesus said in Luke 17, verse 28 to 30, Likewise, also it was at the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that goes back to Jeremiah, they planted in building, but you know what? Their foundation was off what they ate, what they drank, what they bought, and then they sold and they uh, and they planted and built it. Verse 29, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. There's going to be a day where Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's not going to be the soft, cuddly, uh, cutesy little Jesus that the world wants you to believe. Okay? That Jesus, that was old. That was back in the first advent. Second advent, when Jesus comes back, heads are going to roll. All right? This second Jesus, this is the Jesus that, that the Antichrist is going to say is the devil. Okay, this Jesus is coming back. He has no interest in equality. He has no interest in equal rights. He has no interest in pride. Heads are going to roll, and Jesus is telling you it's going to be better for Sodom than it was for the guys that are, we're going to, that he's going to come down and, and, and persecute, you know? First, Matthew 11, verse 24, But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. I don't want to finish on a, on an un, on a negative note. I don't want to finish. I want to give you hope. If you've been struggling with these kinds of besetting sins, if you've been a sinner, and if you realize that God does not want your sin, uh, uh, God does not justify your sin, He doesn't want you to think that, oh, you, I, He made me this way. If you're willing to humble yourself, let go of your pride, uh, there's hope for you. Humble yourself. Come to God with a repentant heart. Okay? We all have that besetting sin. Okay? Your, your sin is just as good as mine. It's all worthy of damnation. And God can forgive any sin except the sin of rejecting His Son. Okay? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, to 9, 6 9 to 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, 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 nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You said this was positive, preacher. It is. It is. Give me a second. Verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye, were, ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You want that righteousness imputed on you? You got to get it from Jesus Christ. Amen. God's not willing that any man should perish. He doesn't want you to go to hell for your sins. He came down to die for you. Would he have died for you if he didn't want you to get saved? Of course not. Of course not. So what do I do? Humble yourselves. Ask the Lord, forgive me. Repent of your sin. Change your mind about, about I don't want to be, I, don't, I, I know that what I, my urges are sinful. I don't want to live in that, but I can't help it. Listen, we're all sinners too. You have to realize that that's not what God wants for you. Repent, have a change of mind, and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, who is God that died, buried, and rose again. And if you don't know how to do that, just pray with me. Pray with me. Just go and ask God. In your own words, tell Him, God, my Father, I am a sinner. And Lord, I, I repent of my sinful condition and believe on Your Son, Jesus Christ, who is God, that He died, buried, and rose again for my sins. And that if I believe on Him for my salvation, I will be saved. Lord, I call upon His name the best way I know how. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And if you do that with all your heart and with your mouth, you will be saved. And the next step is to get yourself a King James Bible, come to a Bible-believing church, get baptized, and live your life in prayer and in servitude. Be a servant like Lot. Now, I'm going to close things off. Let's go ahead and uh, pray the Lord dismiss this church.
Father God, we thank you so much for the word, and we thank you for giving us uh, people to preach to. And Lord, I pray that this message was a blessing. I, Father God, I pray that you can now dismiss us. And Lord, keep us safe, giving traveling mercies to us, Lord. And we pray that we can be uh, here on Wednesday, Lord willing. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, let me close it out.